Okay, so let's go ahead and begin. So uh, today's class, um, you're going to get enough information to build another one of the hardware pieces of the otter, uh, the red shot. Okay, so, um, you know, that's what the assignment is after the lecture today, is, is to do uh, hardware number three, okay, which again is modeling the reg file uh, in either system Verilog or Verilog. But before we get to uh, mostly new material, because I did talk a little bit about the reg file, but I'm going to talk about it, you know, in more detail and like how you would go about modeling it in uh, system Verilog. But before we do that, I want to mostly review some of the things that we talked about already, namely the program counter and also the memory module. So a lot of what we go over uh, is going to be things I talked about before, but there'll be some new stuff too. It was mostly new. Okay, so we built the program counter uh, last week, right? That was actually a week ago. So what is the purpose of the program counter? What is it providing to our auditor? Because what is it outputting? Address of what? Okay, uh, an address of memory where what is located? <laughs> What's that? What's in here? Right, okay. Well, you said it's outputting an address, yeah. right? A memory address, but what's located at that memory address? Yeah. Yeah. Data. What data? What's <laughs> that? Well, the output of the program counter right, goes to this input of the memory module, it's address one. But what is at that address? There, the instruction, right? Remember that that's the whole purpose of this program counter is that it's providing the address of the instruction that's going to be taken. Right? So it provides address of the instruction to be executed. Okay, so that's its purpose. So, so let's look at some of the things that uh, the program counter entails here. Notice it has a reset input. And you design that module, right? And did you make the reset an active low or active high? An active high reset. So if I make this reset active high, and also, when you model the program counter in Verilog or Verilog, is that reset synchronous or asynchronous? Okay, it's synchronous because you put it within what kind of block? Always FF. And always FF. System Verilog, always FF. Sequential. So this resets active high and it's synchronous. So if I make that reset one, and then we get the clock edge. Now, did you make your program counter falling edge or rising edge? Rising edge, because you use the positive edge and the always FF clock. Right? So when this reset is one, and at the time of the zero to one transition of the clock, what's going to happen to the output of this program counter? It's going to go to all zero, right? Again, that's what reset means. Reset for any circuit, right? any logic circuit, any module. If it's active, if it's synchronous, on the clock edge that happens when it's active, your output's going to go zero. So that means when this output goes zero, well, that's the address of the instruction that's going to be executed. And I don't think I mentioned this um, in a previous class, but your first instruction.
for your first instruction of your of your program, your assembly language program, it's always located at address zero. Okay, now, look on your, well, hopefully you still have an otter diagram. You know that diagram that, um, if someone has one, at each, hopefully um, a person at each bench has one. Actually, maybe I can, uh, hold on, I'll get to your question in just a second. Let me give every bench one of these so you can look at it as we talk about this. But we're not looking at this as we talk about it. You're not going to get the full, the full of that. So this reset, looking at that otter diagram, where is that reset coming from? What module is outputting the reset? You're gonna look at the otter diagram. Oh. Okay. You see where it's coming from? It's the cell. Right, the control unit, CU stands for control unit. And like we talked about before, the control unit has two parts to it. It has an FSM, a finite state machine, and it has a decoder. Okay, so, you know, they're broken up into two, but they're both controlling what's going on in the otter. So you see this reset is coming from the control unit, FSM. And we learned about FSMs in 133, right? When, when you define FSMs, what do you start with? What kind of diagram do you start with? State diagram. Right, state diagram. Right? And you're going to see when we get to building the FSM, which won't be for after the mission, so not for another seven weeks. Um, but when we get there, there's going to be a state for that FSM called the initial state, okay, the init state, the initial state. And one of the things that occurs in that initial state that you activate reset. Okay, so when we initialize the otter, we want to reset the program counter because we want to start the program at address zero. And it's the program counter that decides which instruction is going to be executed, right? Because it provides the address to that instruction. So did you have a question? Yeah, so it's address zero because there's no, um, there's no instruction to be down on zero. Does it waste? No, no, no. Wait, when you, um, when you uh, write an assembly language program, and you know, in RAR, when you put that first instruction at the very top, that's address zero. So your very first instruction of your program is that address zero. And we always want to start there. So if I write that if then program, uh, I have to go back to the if branch. Say that again. So I'd like to write a program if there's something if that and I go to if that and I reset, I would go to the first. Well, let's see. Uh, this is something like when reset gets activated, that's something that's occurring not from your program, it's occurring from the module in the audit. And once it, once this becomes address zero, the rest of the audit, we're gonna get to how it all happens in the next, in the next several classes. But that's when your program is being run. Okay, so it's, so like an if statement or something like that, it would be executed. It's after this reset occurs. Okay, so now let's look at 
this PC right. Okay, this one just here. When you built your program counter, did you make that active high or active low? Active high. And is it synchronous or asynchronous? It's synchronous, right? Because it's all it's also in that always FF block, correct? Okay, so if we make this PC right equal to one, and we get a zero to one transition of the clock at this time, what's going to happen? In other words, what does PC right do? Okay, it, it takes the must input and goes up. Right, it, it stores it. So now whatever's on the input is going to be here at the output. Right? And what determines what's at this input is what our select this mux is. Right? We talked about how the mux works. This is the select line. So if this select line is zero, if PC right is one, at the time of the zero to one transition of the clock, this data, which would be the previous instruction address plus four, will now be here. And it'll get written into our register of our program. Right? If, if PC source is one, then it's going to take what's on input one, which is this jump. And we'll talk more about that later. But then that would be at this input. And then that would be get that would be written into the program counter. And therefore this address would be at the output. And that's the address of the instructions being executed. Okay. So on your father diagram, where is PC write? Where is PC write coming from? It's also coming from the FSN. So you see this reset in this PC, right? They're outputs of the control unit FSM. How about PC source? Where is that coming from? Is it? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. The PC ER? Decoder, the, the control unit decoder. Okay. So you see what's controlling, and that's where the name comes from. What's controlling what's going on with this program power are these two inputs coming from the FSM of the controller and this that's coming from the decoder of the controller. Right? This is determining what's on the input of the program power, and this is determining whether the program power gets reset or whether this input data gets written to the counter and therefore becomes the next address to be executed. Next address of the instruction. Okay. Now, what we'll uh, get to next week is this. Branch address generator. See the output of this branch address generator module. That's what goes to this mux. In last class, we talked about we talked about branching. We talked about how uh, the branch instructions, they have an immediate value, right? which, which is just some number. And again, in RARs, we use a label, right? But it's a number. And that number provides an offset to the address you're presently at. So you'll see next week you know, how this hardware accomplishes. This, is, this hardware essentially adds on that offset to the current instruction address and that's what causes it to branch and it's the same idea with the jumps and just like branches jumps have an immediate value which provides an offset to the instruction you're present at and that's what gets the program to leap over other instructions okay all right so any questions about any of this all right, so let's move on now and let's talk a little bit more about uh, the memory module. Right? Because the output of this program counter, it goes to this 
input here labeled address one of the memory. Now you'll notice I use different colors. The reason I use different colors here, what you see in pink, these inputs, and also this output, we're going to talk about later. Okay, we're not ready to talk about this yet. Probably next week we'll start talking about this. So I just want to talk about what's in black. And we already talked a little bit about this uh, address one. Again, that's connected to the output of the program counter. So here, the address of the instruction we executed is going to be. Okay, then we have a read enable one. Uh, we have this uh, VL2. So this read enable one, this is an active high. And by the way, this module, I think I mentioned this before, but this module uh, is going to be provided by Dr. Hummel. Okay, so you're not building the memory module that's given to you at some point. You won't need it till towards the very end. Okay, so this read enable uh, is an active high. It's also synchronous. So what's going to happen at the time of the zero one transition to the clock, as long as this memory read enable is run, is that the instruction that's at this address that's coming from the program counter will now be at output two. So this is where the instruction is going. And then that instruction goes two places. It goes to the right file that we're going to talk about today. And it also goes to this thing called an immediate generator, which we're going to talk about next. Okay. Now, what we didn't talk about yet about this memory module that I want to discuss now are these two inputs, size and sign. Oh, but before we talk about that, just real quick. Where is this memory read enable one coming from? FSN, the control unit FSN. In fact, if you were to look at that diagram, you'll see that all the read and write enables are coming from the FSN. And if you look at the decoder, all the outputs of the decoder go to select lines of MUX. Okay, so the decoder that's controlling the muxes, and it's the FSM that's controlling when reads and writes happen. And we'll talk more about why that's so, you know, later on in the course. Okay. Now notice that uh, size and sign, these two inputs, they're attached to the notation here is IR. IR stands for instruction. So Size is connected to bit 13 and 12 of the machine code of the instruction. And sign is connected to bit 14 of the machine code of the instruction. So if you look at your instruction manual, right, the assembly language manual, what you'll notice is if you look at the load and store command. And we have load byte, right? Load byte unsigned, we have load half word, have load half word unsigned, we have load word. Remember, we don't have a load word unsigned. Why was that again? Why is there an unsigned for byte and half word, but not an unsigned for word? It has to do with the number of bits. How many bits is the word? 32 bits. How many bits is the half word? 16. How many bits is the byte? 16. See, the reason you have an unsigned for byte and half word is because for sign extension or for padding with zeros, well, if it's not 32 bits, you're going to have to add bits to the front. Right? But if it's a word, it's already 32 bits. So there's nothing to extend. So that's the reason. So that's the big difference between the unsigned and the sign when it comes to the load and the store commands is that if it's signed, it's, it's going to be sign extension, right? It's going to take the most significant bit and use that bit to extend. But if it's unsigned, it's just going to pad with zeros. Well, again, the most significant bit doesn't have a sign meaning with unsigned, which is very important. But anyway, 
if you take a look at it's 13 and 12, because remember in the detailed description, it has what the machine code is for DDU there. So if I look here for either load byte or load byte unsigned, uh, bits 12 and 13 are zero, zero. Uh, if I look at load half word and load half word unsigned, bits 12 and 13, 12 is one, 13 is zero. See, those two bits are different. Than what they are to place. And then if I look at um, the little word, well, those two bits are one zero. So you see these two bits are identifying to what's inside this module, whether you have a byte, whether you have a half word, or whether you have a word uh, in those instructions. That's how the hardware um, identifies the size of the data for that. Instruction and only apply for load and store instructions. You have a question? Yeah, for words. So what you're saying is like it's implicit, like it's that you can put the output of the program like inside of the side of the software. You know, well, yeah, it, it's going to be determined by how it's being treated in a program. Um, but the key point again, because remember, you know, all binary type signals zeros and ones in of themselves they're just Zero one, right? High or low? It's the person that decides how it's going to be treated, right? It's a spine dense number. But the reason why in the instructions there's a distinction between signed and unsigned in the instructions for both byte and half word is because of the sign extension or the padding of zero. So because if it's signed, you're going to sign extend. If it's unsigned, you're going to pad with zero. And, and you see that's what this bit is for. This bit 14. If you look at bit 14, if it's a load word or load byte or load half word where it's being treated as a sign, well then that bit 14 is zero. But if it's an unsigned, like a half word unsigned or a byte unsigned, that bit is one. Okay? So these two inputs are being used for, for identifying load byte or word and also whether you have signed or not. So the significance of that, or one of the significances, is that any sign extension or padding with zeros, it happens in the memory module. Okay? So that's something you're not going to have to worry about as far as design. Like I said, this module is, is divided. So what is the giant uh, well, what the size input is for is specifically for instructions that either have half word, byte, or word. So I was using the load instructions as an example, but it would be true for the store. You know how you have store word, store half word, store byte. So if you were to look at these two bits, and I, I don't have it memorized what the actual values are, but you know, you're going to have a two bit value for byte, you're going to have a different two bit value for half word, and you're going to have a two, different two bit value for word. Again, the reason I'm taking time and, um, you know, kind of going back and forth between the instructions and the hardware is because, as I've been saying every class, the software and the hardware, they're intertwined. You don't really understand one without understanding the other. The other. Hopefully, it's helping just to get that home. That hey, the machines are all I have coming. Okay, like I said, we'll talk more because there's more that's in here. You know, we'll talk more about what these other inputs are for uh, later on in the course. But another thing I want to talk about that also goes with the memory module is that remember, the otter memory is contained within this module. And we talked about how the otter memory is organized. How many bits do we have? What's a word? How many bits is a word? It's 32 bit words. And then how about the addressing? What's significant about the addressing? Again, 
Uh, okay, there's, let's see, in each row, 32 bits, and then within each row, there's four what? Bytes. Bytes. Right, because a byte is how many bits? Eight. Right, and it's 32 bit word. Right, so each row that has 32 bits has four bytes. And then what's significant, like memory wise, about each byte? What's that? First word. Is, okay. Yeah, that's true that this byte here, now I'm not going to write all the leading zeros. I'll just write the last four zeros. But right, this is where your address zero is going to be. Right, and then this word would have address four, right, this one address eight, and so on. Okay, but what about these other bytes? Out of memory, it's 32 bit words. And how is it address? What's the key word? Byte accessible. Thank you. Right. Byte addressable. So it's organized in 32 bit words and it's also byte addressable. See, that's important. You're going to see why coming up in a minute. Okay, so remember how we talked about. Each byte has an address. That's why you can use, you know, like a load byte or um, a store byte command, right? Because you can you can identify each byte with an address, right? Um, and this also explains why the instructions are separated by four an address, right? Because the instructions are thirty-two bits, so you have to use a word address for an instruction. Right? So that's why the instruction. That's why you had this plus four increment. Right, when you build the program now. Okay. And then do you remember we had uh, different segments, right? The, the auto memory is segmented. Where are the instructions located? What do we call that segment? What is it called? Uh, well, these are addresses. Like we said, each byte has an address. Each instruction. Okay, that that's where the instructions are located within the auto memory. The program. That's true. Right. So, you know, we got the program. But what's the name of the segment where the instructions are located? When you write a program, you're typing in what? Code, there we go. It's called the code segment. And then above the code segment, we have what segment? Data is next, right? We haven't said too much about this. In fact, I don't think we've said anything about it, but we will in a week or so, maybe two weeks. Okay, what's above the data segment? Stack. We won't get to the stack until the very end. It has to do with subroutines name. Okay, and then there's some unreserved sections, but oh, and then what do we call these three together? What do we call the code segment, the data segment, and the stack segment all together? It's given a name. Because this is the memory that's actually inside the module. There's there's another segment. Well, I'll get to that later. Wait. Uh, real memory, real memory great. Yeah, this is real memory. See, real memory contains these three segments. There's another segment up here. You know, there's unreserved or reserved sections that are used. But what's the other segment that's up here? Right, that's the memory map IO. See, that's not part of real memory because that's sort of like external. Um, real memory, the stack, the data, and the code segments, the limits, remember that address limits that go from zero, you know, all zeros to zero, zero, zero. These limits here, address limits of real memory, that's determined by the FPGA 
on the basis board. Okay, so remember those limits are hard uh, hardware limits. The limits that you see for the code segment, the data and staff, those were determined by you know Dr. Hummel and Dr. Quinas, you know, the programmers decide that they could be changed. Okay. Um, you know, if you look at the code segment, it goes from address zero to address I think it's five F F F That's sixty-four K bytes, and if you divide by four, it's sixteen K words. So sixteen K instructions. So you know that's plenty. You're not gonna write a program in this spot that's gonna have more than you know sixteen K instructions. So it's plenty to that we can no, what I said was, um, what we mean by real memory is that this is the part of the memory that um, would be in the FPGA. Memory map IO, remember that? Um, basically, that's your peripheral, like your switches and your buttons and your LEDs, seven segment and so on. That's external that the processor knows by an address. So um, the real memory of the max is set, and then what people did is the of it. Right. Yeah, I don't know if it was Dr. Hummel yeah, specifically, but someone decided on the limit to code, data, and staff. It should be like a half or a third. So three years, so it's not hard to Well, it, it's something that could be easily changed. Um, in fact, we'll get to. It won't be to the very end, but you'll see where those are determined eventually. We're just not ready for that. But, but yeah, these limits of the of the code segment, data segment, stack, uh, stack um, those address limits, they could be easily changed by the program. Okay, the, the address range of real memory, that can't be changed unless you get a different FP, um, you know, basis board, like a different development. As long as you use the basis three board, Real memory address range at set. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Was there anything else I wanted to say about this? Like, that was all for uh, memory modules. So, any questions before we move on to the reg file? Because now we'll get into things that are mainly new. You know, most of this was reviewed. Some of it was new, but most of it was reviewed. All right, so let's talk about uh, the reg file. Okay, so uh, notice clock input, right? But that should be no surprise because registers, registers are sequential, so you need clock input. Um, you have this enable up here, enable input. You have address one, address two input, write address uh, input. You got a write data input, and then there's these two outputs, okay, RS1, RS2. Okay, so if you look at the otter uh, diagram, EL2, the memory module, where our instruction is, that's going to connect over to our reg file. Now, it also goes to the immediate generator, but we'll talk about that next week. But right now, the instruction connects over to our reg file and look here. This 19 through 15 of the machine code of the instruction connects to this input address one. This 24 to 20 of the machine code instruction goes to address two and bits 11 through seven of our machine code instruction goes to the right address. So for example, if you were to look at um, you know, you can look at any instruction. I just picked this one out. Well, any instruction that depends on registers. Um, you know, I just picked this one just randomly. I picked this uh, add instruction. So it's add, then X5. So what does X5 indicate here? Yeah, that's the destination register, right? Again, if you, if you go to your listing of instructions, right? In the manual, you find where the add. Okay, I'm looking at this instruction here, the add instruction. This is RD, the destination register. This is RS1, 
source register one. This is RS2, source register two. And also, if you look at the detailed description of the instruction, you'll see that in the uh, machine code, and it's also right here, bits 24 through 20. Okay, so those five bits right there, that's the address. Address. I need another email. Yeah. Thank you. This is the address. of RS2. You see 24 to 20 address two and, and, and look, 10100 and binary, what is that equal to? What's 10100 in, well, what is it equal to in base 10? 20, right? No zeros, or excuse me, no ones, no twos. We have a four, don't have any eights, have a 16. So 16 plus four, so 20. So you see, register 20, that's at address 20. Um, from 19 to 15, that's address of source register one, RS1. Right, what's zero one zero one zero ten? Right, which agrees with this. And then bits eleven through seven. That's the address of the destination register. R B. Right, so five. Okay. And you know that's true of any instruction that's dealing with registers. The address of source register one is going to be here. The address of source register two is going to be these bits. The address of the destination register is going to be those bits. So you see in the machine code, the address of the registers of the red file, they're always in the same spot. Now, from six to zero, these bits here, what are, what, what are those bits called? Because you have to know what those bits were when you did the first software assignment, when you're doing reverse engineering. Like what are these seven bits called? Op code. These last seven bits are always the op code. Okay. So, so again, see what you see in the hardware relates to the instructions. Okay. All right. So, how does this red file? Uh, operate. Well, it has uh, what we call dual async It has dual async reads. And I'll talk more about that coming up. And it has a single synchronous Right. So where in the memory module are they coming? RD. RD. Well, we're going to get to how the registers inside the right file are organized coming up. So hold on to that question. Okay, so RS1, RS3, those are the files that are going to go out there. I'm going to get to that. We're getting so you're a little bit ahead of me. Okay, so we have dual async reads and we have a single uh, synchronous write. Now notice that the reg file just has a single enable. See, that's different than the memory module. In the memory module, it has these three different read enables and it has a write enable. Now, again, we haven't talked about all of this yet, but one of the differences between the reg file and our memory module is that we have you know more read enables here. Reg file just has a single enable. And when this enable is a one, 
So when enable equals a one, that's when a write is going to happen. Okay, so if you want to do a write, right, you want to put data into it into the destination register because you would only write write to endpoints. When you're writing to a register, um, you want this enable input to be a one, and then it's synchronous. So not only does this have to be a one, but you have to have a zero to one transition of the clock. If you're going to read and get data from the writing file, then this enables a zero. Okay, so if the enables a zero, you're doing a read, and because it's asynchronous, it doesn't depend on the clock. Okay, so if enables zero, it's reading. If enables one on the zero to one transition of the clock, that's when you're writing. And what dual uh, async reads means is that we can get data from both of these outputs at the same time. Okay, so when this is zero, we're doing a read, we're reading, we can read from both of those. Okay, that's what a dual read means. Okay. So when you're reading the data at either RS1 or RS2, that's going to be the data. At RS1, it's going to be the data at address. Address between you know bits nineteen and fifteen, and then RS two. That's where your data address is twenty four to twenty. Okay, and then when you're writing, the enable has to be a one. And then the data that gets written in, that's what's going to be at this input here, WD. WD stands for write data. And that's going to be the data at address. It's 11 to 7. Okay, so that's your write address. Okay. So when you're reading the contents of the source one register at this address is going to be at this output, the data, the contents of um, the register at this address, and then if you're writing the data, you know, the contents uh, of the register um, at this address, that's what's going to be uh, written to. Red data is an output or is it an input? This here? Yeah. This is an input. So yeah. the outputs are RS1 and RS2? Yeah, these are the only outputs. Yeah. These are outputs. Everything else is an input. All right. Address is an input. You know, this is an input because it's it's data that's being written to a register. Right. These are outputs because that's data we're getting from register. Right. Again. The register that we're getting data from is determined by the address for these bits. And the register that we're writing to is determined by the address from these bits. Okay. Um, but it, a thing to note, because I think this is the first module that we've seen this, is here we do have, you know, async reads along with synchronous write. You know, everything so far that we talked about in these modules, as far as like write and read and also reset, they've all been synchronous. I think this is the first case of us having a module where we've got something async. And I'll show you how you model that in the Verilog coming up. Okay. All right. So that's, you know, what the inputs and the uh, outputs for the reg file is. Now, just like we talked about how otter memory is organized. Let's talk about how the reg file memory is organized. Well, you have on your bench, each bench has that page that was in a handout I gave on the first day of class that has all the different reg files. How many reg files are there? There's 32. So those reg files, 
um, or organized um, in 32 rows, like each register is a row. Right, so I can keep going, but there's, there's 32 rows. Each row is a register, and each register is 32 bits. Okay, so, so far, it, it, it's very similar to the memory module, except the memory module has a lot more registers and rows, right? <laughs> you know, this is only 32. This is, you know, zero, 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 all the way up to all else, right? So, I mean, a lot more memory in the memory module than what we have in the reg file, right? It's only 32. But here's a big difference. Otter memory is byte addressable. Reg file is not byte addressable. Okay, it's just each row, each register has an address. You know, register zero has address zero, register one has address one, register two has address two, and so on. Right? Register 31 has address 31. And we talked about this earlier, and also we see it right here. How many bits? How many bits do we need for a reg file address? Just five, right? Because you can represent zero through 31 with five bits, right? Otter memory, it has 32 bit address, <laughs> right? A lot more registers than what we have in the reg file. But you see any operation, like any mathematical operation or logical operation, it takes place in the reg file, right? So when you're doing like an add command, and command, um, you know, shift right, shift left, right? It's affecting the data in these registers. All right, so any questions up to this point? I think I just need another 15 minutes or so. Do you want me to keep going or do you want to take a break? So most people in this class like they just plow right through it. <laughs> in my later classes, they like to take a break, but that's probably because they just had lunch or ate something. So. Plus it's a little cooler in the morning, right? So you feel more awake maybe because you're freezing. <laughs> okay, so. Now let's get to the uh, like the nitty gritty stuff as far as what you need to do for your assignment. Because the assignment today, hardware number three, is to build this thing. All right. So first thing is to model this reg file, this this memory here. We're going to use an array of vectors, and you probably don't remember, but um, what was it? It was hardware. Hardware number one, when you're using the program and you watch my video and in the video, I kind of went over, you know, not a lot of detail, but I went over a little bit of the code that Dr. Hummel wrote for the program. And in that code, he uses this array of vectors, okay, for the program part in the code segment of the memory module. And I think it's best explained with an example. So. Here's an example of how you create array of vectors in the system Verilog. And I would assume it's the same in Verilog. So in this example, we want to make seven 10 bit vectors. And each vector would represent a register. And so, you know, instead of having uh, 32, 32 bit, you know, this would give us seven 10 bit. Okay, like seven rows, each row would be 10 bits. Okay. Well, this is the code that you would need, okay? It's just logic. And then you have these numbers, you know, in front of RAM and then these numbers in bracket after. And what this will create is it will create an array where there's seven rows. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven rows and each row is 10 bits. This grid essentially one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Wow, that's good on the first try. Why is it for the part Well, this one, this one's going to be that MSV. Yeah, 
and this one's going to be the LSD. And, and just by convention, we we normally call the least significant the zeroest bit, and then the most significant whatever the highest bit number. So like in your grid, you know, this would be the zeroest bit column, if you will, and this would be the, the ninth or the most significant bit. And then this would be register zero, and this would be register seven. And, and, and this is just by convention. I suppose people could switch it, but it wouldn't be conventional. Did I answer your question or? Yeah. I'm sorry. Did I answer? Yeah, it's just by. Um, I think, well, did you, by chance, did you have Dr. Mealy for 133? Because I think Dr. Mealy sometimes switches it, which is kind of an odd thing, but. Uh, in parentheses, you have each vector equals reg. It's not reg type in the bottom. It's a register. Register. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Exactly. Yeah, just like, you know, each row here is a register, and each row here is a register. Right? So this one line is going to create, um, <laughs> you know, the memory for you. Kind of nice. <laughs> Instead of like building individual registers and somehow, you know, putting them together. So, okay, so any questions? Any more questions on this? All right, so now, once you have the array created, this just creates the array, okay? Um, once you have it, now, if you, were to, if you were to write this, RAM in bracket zero, what that's going to do is uh, take the data in a row, you know, 10 bit data. At address zero. So here in the brackets is the address. Okay. And this would take the data from that address, all 10 bits. Okay. If you did this, okay, RAM bracket four, bracket seven, that's just going to take bit seven of the data at this address. Um, if you have this, that's going to take these bits, bits four through seven at this address. And then if you did this, it would just take the 10 bit data at whatever this address is. So this is like we're using a symbol instead of a number. But you know, if address two corresponded to, you know, register five, it would just take the data in that register five. Okay, now I gotta move the camera. Hey, look at that, I remembered to move the camera. Okay, so on your uh, handout that's got the registers, right? That's in the reg file. Remember we talked about how the first five registers zero through register four, they're kind of special registers. And we, we've only talked about one of them, right? The very first one at register zero. What's special about register zero? The contents are always zero. And this is where you have to make it happen. Okay, it, it, it's just, doesn't happen, you gotta make it happen. Okay, we want the contents of register zero to always be zero. That's why it's called the zero register. Now, there, there's basically two ways to do it. Okay, one way is to initialize that register in zero and then just never write to it, right? Because if you initialize and make it zero to begin with and you never write to it, it's always gonna be zero. So that's one way you can do it. Another way is just make it zero every time it's read. Now, out of these two options, I like this way. Yeah, I like this one. That's how I did it. I like it. Okay? It doesn't mean you have to do it that way, but that's what I chose to do. Now, like I have written here, you need to figure out how to do it in system better. Like, I'm just telling you it has to be done, and I'm giving you a couple of options. I'm telling you which one I like, but you got to figure it out. Okay? Now, if you decide to do it my way, one thing you can do that's uh, helpful is you can just initialize your entire array to zero. Like, initialize all the contents of all the registers to zero to start with. And if you want to do it that way, here's the code that will easily do it where you use a for loop. Okay, so I'm giving you the code. All you have to do is do this if you want to initialize um, 
all your registers are zero, and then as long as you never write to register zero, it will always stay zero. Okay. Now, as I said earlier, the write for the reg file, which happens when this is a one. Okay, when this enable is a one, that's when the write happens. And because it's synchronous, it will happen on a zero to one edge of the clock. If this is zero, then you're doing an asynchronous read. Okay? Both of these are asynchronous reads. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can do an asynchronous uh, type of input. And again, I'm just making a recommendation. If you learn something different in 133 that you're more comfortable with, that's fine. But I think an easy way to do an asynchronous read is just to use an assigned state. So here's an example where I'm assigning an output. Now, again, you want to be descriptive with your outputs and inputs, just like you have been with the previous um, assignment. So instead of just calling this RF1, I called it RF underscore RS1 for reg5. Okay. But you see this assigned statement, it would take the data at this address, a address one, which this input here, one of the um, address inputs, it would take this data and put it at this output. Okay, and it doesn't depend on plot. Like it's it's not within an always FF or always com. It's just a single line uh, in your code. Okay, so that's how I recommend doing the async reads. But again, if you're more comfortable doing it some other way, that's perfectly okay. So here's the outline of what you have to do. Okay, this is an outline of what your code is going to look like for this reg file. Like any module, you're going to have the name first, and you got to declare your inputs and outputs. So that's no different than we've done probably you know, at least a dozen or more times now, counting 133. Then the next thing you should do is create the array. Right? So you're going to have a line like this, but you want it to be 32 bits um, by 32 bits, right? 32 registers, 32 bits for each register. Then initialize your memory to zero. So you can just use this code here. Then you would do your async reads, okay, which again are just assignment statements. And I gave you an example. And then you got to do the sync write. Okay. Um, now, you've already done a sync write before because you have to do that for the uh, program counter. But what's a little bit challenging for this is you've got to make sure this happens. Then you've got to make sure that the contents of register zero are always zero. Okay, so I would say that's probably the uh, the thing you got to think about a little bit. I think the rest of it is pretty cookbook the way I laid it out. Okay, but making sure this happens is something you might have to think about a little bit. Okay. All right. So with this, you should be ready to do. Assignment uh, hardware number three. Do you have any questions before you get started? Okay. And uh, Derek should be here pretty soon. He'll probably get here around 9.30.